Good morning. Let's exalt our Lord together this morning. Would you stand? He is an awesome God. Holy. You know it? Let's sing it. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom. Power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns in heaven above with wisdom and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom. Power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He is exalted, shall we? He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever is still shall wait. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. Sing it again. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His foot shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on the high. I will give thanks to Thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to Thee among the nations. For thy steadfast love is great, is great to the heaven, and thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, upon the heaven. Let thy glory Repeat it. Sing it. Be exalted, O God, upon the heaven. Let thy glory be over all the earth. Well, you remember what was happening this time last week, don't you? A little fellow named Ivan was in the neighborhood, and this time last week we scattered everywhere. I think we were down to about uh, 30 or 40 people on the campus is all that was left, and you were with friends or family watching the Weather Channel or the news and seeing what was happening and praying that God would spare us, and boy, God did spare us. Hot air from Texas kept it out of New Orleans. Who would have ever thought? I'll never complain about Texas braggarts again. God did spare us. And then we wake up this morning, and what does the guy on the weather tell us this morning? Ivan's back. 
And we have rain and we have wind, courtesy of Ivan the Terrible. Man, those storms, they just keep coming around, don't they? Have you ever wondered why the hymnal of the church is so filled with praise and exaltation to God when life is so complicated and so messy? Why we give such praise and adoration to God when we're not all rich and we're not all famous and we don't all have easy lives? Why would you have the palatial confines of willing hand manner to live? Would you want to give praise and glory to God? And why would you have to work three jobs and try to squeeze in time for your family and kids in the midst of all the classes and work that you have to do? Would you give glory and praise to God? Why is the hymnal of the church filled with songs of praise for the church has been persecuted down through the ages, hunted like animals, martyred and killed, even happening today? More people killed for the faith in the 20th century than all the previous centuries of the church put together? Why do we have a hymn book filled with praise and adoration to God? Even though the storms come around all the time in the lives of believers, God's grace is always sufficient to see His people through. Even though the storms come all the time, God's grace is always sufficient. And it's the frequency of the storms that prove the faithfulness and sufficiency of God's grace. It never runs out, no matter how many times Ivan comes to see us. Oh, we're so grateful for a God who loves us so much, but not only loves us, has such great power, He doesn't need perfect circumstances to make us think He is worthy of worship in the midst of heartache and trouble and uncertainty and toil. We know He is worthy of worship. I'm going to ask Dr. Alan Jackson if he would come and join me here on the platform. Dr. Jackson teaches youth ministry and student ministry here on our campus. He's been with us for a number of years. We're delighted to have his presence with us. And as we come before the Lord today, let us do remember those people all over the United States. Literally, this storm has touched and affected and damaged more states in the United States than any other storm in the history of the nation. Let's do remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who still don't have power who still don't have a place to live, whose children may not be in school for weeks, who are facing day after day after day after day of unremitting toil and difficulty and have nothing but scraps left of their lives. As we go before the Lord, let us not only exalt Him and thank Him for His mercy He's shown us in this last week, let us pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they too would experience His mercy in different circumstances. Dr. Father, first and foremost, we would pray for those people who feel like their world has been blown apart. God, moms and dads who are trying to figure out where they're going to put their babies down to sleep, power that's gone out, food that's iffy, gasoline supplies that are not there. God, the the uncertainty of all of that is, um, is so hard for us to even wrap our minds around. And yet, God, none of that surprises you. The uncertainty of a culture, the uncertainty of, uh, of everything that's going on is simply a reminder that the absolute truth of your word and your presence, your holiness, your sovereignty is that which we can cling to, the rock that we can hold on to. I thank you that the certainty of your word is proclaimed in this room and I pray that uh, even in the midst of our concern for relatives and friends and, and church members and pastors and teachers and and staff people in all of these churches that have been severely affected, Father, even as they are trying to minister to their communities while their world is apart. I specifically remember Dr. Trailer. Thank God you would help him to be a, a prophet in the midst of a storm. I thank you for this opportunity to gather to hear your word spoken. I pray that uh, you would penetrate our hearts with it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you, just shake them by the hand and remind them, God's grace comes more often than Ivan ever will. Would you do that? Thank you so very much. 
We are delighted to have you with our in this time of worship on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And a very special day it is. We're delighted to have with us Dr. Richard Land is our preacher for the day. Today is our annual church state lecture. We talk about the relationship of the church and the state. Uh, Baptists have always been uh, quite opinionated about that relationship. And one of the great contributions of Baptists to the world is our insistence on the separation of church and state and what that means precisely. And so we like every generation of students to be reminded of that very important doctrine and conviction on the part of Baptists, one of our great contributions to the history of the world. With Dr. Land on this trip is his wife, Dr. Becky Land. We welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, your husband is so much easier to put up with when you're around with him, and we're very glad to have you. Dr. Land, would you please come and join me up here? I want to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit. There's a big old semi-trailer, 18-wheeler, parked in front of Hardin Student Center that has painted all over the side, IVoteValues.com. Would you tell us about that? I'd be delighted to. IVoteValues.com is something that God put in the heart of our staff, and uh, we had a, um, a person on our staff who was a Sunday school teacher at a Baptist church in Lebanon, Tennessee, and uh, he had a Sunday school uh, classmate whose name was Sid Yoakum, and he said, he said, Brother Kerry, I've got this 18-wheeler that used to be carrying around stuff, souvenirs for the Charlie Daniels band. And he said, it's out there in my barn. And he said, I just, I've been offered money for it, but I just feel like God wants to use it for his service. And Kerry goes, okay, uh, we'll pray about that. And this had been going on for more than a year. And as we began to talk about the fact that it's a disgrace that 30% of Southern Baptists are not registered to vote. And we wanted to do an unprecedented uh, voter registration and voter education drive this year for Christian Citizenship Sunday, we remembered the truck. And we went out and looked at the truck, and God worked, and that uh, old uh, 18-wheeler is now the slick, painted-up, IVoteValues.com Express that's been going all over the country, been in 13 states so far, saying IVoteValues.com. And it's, a, it's an attempt to make certain that we want to do everything we can to make sure that every eligible voter is registered, every registered voter is informed, and every informed voter votes, and when they vote, they vote their values, their beliefs, and their convictions. Now, there are some PCs in there. That doesn't mean politically correct. It means personal computers. Uh, and you can go through there. You, an, you can take a test, a civics test, to see how, how you're doing. You can get a certificate. You can get information on how you can do a voter registration drive in your church. Uh, the voter registration for this election ends 30 days before the election in most states. But you can register, you can get information. We've got 16,000 Southern Baptist churches that have downloaded or taken our materials in conjunction with uh, Focus on the Family. Focus on the Family looked at our stuff. See, we're, we're sort of the swift boats. You know, we're, we're a small agency. We're sort of the swift boats of evangelical life. And we were able to get up and running. And when Dobson's group came along and said, we want to do a voter registration campaign, what are y'all doing? They looked at what we were doing and said, well, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Can we use what you're doing? We said, sure. And so they're using it. They're, use, they're calling it ivotevalues.org. We call it ivotevalues.com. And together, we have distributed over 10,000 toolkits, which are little packets on how you can do a voter registration campaign in your church. And we're praying that God will bless it because it is a sin not to vote. Romans 13. You're to be subject to the civil magistrate for conscience sake. That means you obey the law, you pay your taxes, and you vote. And when you vote, you vote your values, your beliefs, and your convictions. Amen. Well, I hope you'll stop by the van while it's here. Uh, October 2nd will be the 30 days before the November 2nd registration. So between now and uh, October 2nd, if you have not registered to vote, you need to do so. You need to encourage your people to do so. There are Christians all over the world who would love to be able to have a vote in their government's elections. And for us to squander that opportunity is indeed a sin. So stop by the van and learn about what you can do to help with voter registration sometime during the day today. We're delighted to have it on campus. Now let's have another time of worship, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Land. By the way, the PowerPoint uh, was knocked out by our storm, and they were not able to get it up and running before chapel. They are continuing to work on it to make 
pop up at some point, but that's why we don't have the PowerPoint going today. All right. The more that we focus on who God is and exalt all that He is and what He's done, our own need becomes more evident. In your hymnal, there's the hymn number 450. I need thee every hour. Hymn number 450. We're going to sing the first and the third stanza. Just remain seated. Sing it to the Lord. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. No tender voice like thine can again as a prayer to the Father. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I call
separation of church and state. One of the most used and, I must say, one of the most misunderstood and one of the most abused phrases in the English language in the last half of the 20th century. Where did the phrase come from? Well, it is widely believed to have come from a letter written by John, written by Thomas Jefferson to the Baptist pastors of Danbury, Connecticut. And remember, when Thomas Jefferson wrote this letter saying that there ought to be a wall of separation between the church and the state, he was writing to Baptist pastors in Connecticut who were suffering discrimination, if not outright persecution, from an official, tax-supported state church in Connecticut. And you say, how could that be? Well, here's how it could be. When the First Amendment to the Constitution was passed, it says Congress shall make no law affecting an establishment of religion, nor interfering with the free exercise thereof. The operative word was Congress. That meant that the federal government could not make an established church or interfere with the free exercise of religion. There was no prohibition against state governments doing it. And nine of the original 13 states had tax-supported state churches. And in every instance, they persecuted and discriminated against Baptists. Now, the last two states to get rid of their tax-supported state churches were Connecticut, and Massachusetts, who did not do so until 1832. Now, you ask, why don't we have any tax-supported state churches today? Because of the passage of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which was required by every southern state to ratify as a condition of getting back into the Union after the Civil War. And for over a 100 years now, the Supreme Court has interpreted, I think quite rightly, the, the 14th Amendment says that everything that the federal government is forbidden from doing in the first 10 amendments, state and local governments are forbidden to do as well. In equal protection under the law means you can't have a tax-supported state church that gives preference to one faith or one denomination or one religion over another. But you have to understand Jefferson's letter in that context. He was writing to Baptists in Connecticut where they had an established state church. And he said, I think there ought to be a separation, a wall of separation between the church and the state. There ought not to be an established official church that is given state preference. That's what he meant. He did not mean what, has, what it has been interpreted and twisted and turned and turned on its head to mean by far too many liberals and far too many secularists in the last half of the 20th century, which is that separation of church and state means there needs to be a wall of separation between religiously informed moral values and public policy. That is discrimination against religion. And it's not what Jefferson believed. In fact, let me give you a little background on that letter to the Baptist churches of Danbury, Connecticut. On a Friday... A Baptist evangelist named John Leland, after whom our offices in Washington, D.C. are named, Leland House. John Leland, who had been very instrumental in getting the First Amendment ratified. In fact, he cut a deal with James Madison, and Madison said, if you'll get the Baptists in Virginia to vote for ratification of the federal Constitution, I promise you, I will bring an amendment in the first Congress to make certain there'll be no national establishment of religion. And that is how the First Amendment came to be. Congress shall make no law affecting an establishment of religion, nor 
uh, governmental interference with the free exercise thereof. Leland, after the Revolutionary War and after Virginia narrowly voted not to outlaw slavery, Leland went back home to his native Massachusetts and became a Baptist evangelist there and got far more involved in politics than I think any Baptist minister should. So involved, in fact, that after Thomas Jefferson was elected president in what was surely the most bitter election uh, campaign in American history, the Democrats of western Massachusetts wanted to send a token of their regard and their love and appreciation to Thomas Jefferson. So they voted John Leland as to head a delegation to take a several hundred pound cheese. Now, I say several hundred pounds, uh, Brother Chuck, because some documents say it was 600 pounds. Some say it was 1,000 pounds. Let's just say it was a big cheese. So they took it by wagon all the way to Washington, and they showed up on the first Friday of the new year at Thomas Jefferson's house, the White House. And Jefferson came out to greet them. Leland said, Mr. President, we want to give you this cheese as a token of the regard that we have for you in western Massachusetts, and we want to assure you that no Federalist cows contributed any milk to this cheese, only Democrat cows. He prayed for the president. He praised the president as the greatest statesman of the age, that the hopes and dreams of all Americans were pinned on him. Jefferson thanked them. He accepted the cheese. Leland left. Jefferson went back into the White House, and the assistants took the cheese to the White House kitchen. That was on Friday morning. Then Jefferson had lunch. It's not recorded whether he had any of the cheese or not. That afternoon, that very afternoon, he wrote the famous letter to the Baptist preachers of Danbury, Connecticut, saying that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. On Sunday morning, the next Sunday morning, Thomas Jefferson went to a worship service in the chamber of the House of Representatives where he sat on the front row to hear a sermon by the Baptist evangelist John Leland preach from the speaker's podium of the U.S. House of Representatives. Clearly, Jefferson didn't understand separation of church and state the way the current Supreme Court understands separation of church and state. Our forefathers never intended separation of church and state to be a separation of religious conviction in forming moral values in public policy. And that is the heritage that we must reclaim from the courts who would deny it to us. There has been a 50-year sustained effort to seek, to trivialize, and to marginalize Christianity in particular and religion in general from the public sphere. It's documented in a book by Stephen Carter called The Culture of Disbelief. Stephen Carter is particularly well-versed to write this book. He is a distinguished professor of constitutional law at the Yale University Law School, which makes him, if not a secular cardinal, a secular bishop in the Church of Secularism. In that book, he details how the various elites in this culture have attempted over the last 50 years, the media elite, the legal elite, the cultural elite, even the religious elites have tried to marginalize and trivialize the Christian faith and, to dry, and religion and drive it to the margins of our culture as something that has no place in public policy. The dead end 
the dead end of that kind of thinking is embodied in the statement of Senator John Kerry in which he said, as a Catholic, I believe that life begins at conception. But I do not believe that I have the right to seek to impose my religious beliefs on any other American, and so I'm going to defend every woman's right to choose. Now let's unpack that for a moment. He has already said that it's a human life from conception onward. But that because he believes it is a human life based upon his religious conviction, he is going to consciously segregate and separate his religious beliefs from his public policy position. That makes him a public policy schizophrenic who is going to consciously govern as a functional atheist. Now, let's unpack that argument a little more. I have a statue in my office of Martin Luther King, Jr. as he writes the letter from the Birmingham jail. As a Baptist minister, he was in the Birmingham jail because he refused to obey an unjust law that discriminated against him and did not allow him basic rights as a citizen because of the color of his skin. And he said it was an unjust law because it didn't coincide with the moral law of God. The entire civil rights movement was an attempt by Martin Luther King Jr. and others to take their religiously informed moral values, i.e. racism is wrong and racism is a sin, and to use it to change public policy and to change the law. And guess what? They were attempting to impose their religiously motivated moral beliefs on George Wallace and Lester Maddox, and thank God they were if we are to believe Kerry's rubric and his rhetoric, then he believes that Dr. King wouldn't have had the right to try to impose his religious belief on segregationists and Klansmen. This is a recipe for disaster. And it is a recipe cooked up in the kitchen of the secularist. Separation of church and state means that we don't want any government sponsorship of religion. As we say in our Baptist faith and message, God alone is the Lord of the conscience, and He has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are contrary to His Word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. Now, why is that? It is to protect the church. When the church and the state get tangled up together, it's not even a marriage. It's an arrangement where the church becomes the concubine. The last thing we should ever want is government-sponsored religion. Government-sponsored religion is like getting hugged by a python. It squeezes all the life out of you and you fall over dead. Just look at the empty cathedrals of Europe. We don't want government-sponsored religion. It is your privilege and my privilege and your responsibility and my responsibility and your obligation and my obligation to share our faith. That's our job. But when we share our faith and people come to a new understanding of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it changes every area of their life, not just their personal devotional life, not just their family life, not just their church life. As Francis Schaeffer has so eloquently said it, if it's true, true, with a capital T, it's true 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it applies to every area of your life. 
It applies to your work. It applies to your social life. It applies to your dating life. It applies to every area of your life. We have a right and an obligation and a responsibility to go forth and to seek to bring our religious conviction to bear on public policy issues. That's not called a violation of separation of church and state. That's called religious freedom. It's called freedom of speech. To say that Christians and other people of faith don't have the right to bring their religious convictions to bear on public policy issues is to discriminate against religion, and that's the largest form of discrimination going on in this country today. Not discrimination by religion, but discrimination of religion by the secular forces in this country. The state owes to every church, the Baptist Faith and Message says, protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. No governmental interference with the free exercise of religion. You have absolute right to freedom of conscience. And we are committed to the protecting the right of the freedom of conscience of every person in this country. When Madeline Murray O'Hare was alive, I and others said, we disagree with everything she says and we defend to the death her right to say it. Everyone has. Freedom of conscience. It is a God-given right. In providing for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than others. No group should be given favoritism. If you're going to give um, a partnership with one group to do something, then you can't discriminate against other groups. We filed a friend of the court brief on your behalf when, this, when a federal court said, that vouchers and tax credits were okay, but not for religious institutions. Now, Southern Baptists are deeply divided on the question of vouchers and tax credits. So we don't file friend of the court briefs on those issues. But this was a pure, simple case of religious discrimination. We said if you're going to give vouchers and tax credits, you can't single out religious schools and religious institutions to say they are the only ones that can't get the aid. That is discrimination against religion. That means that the government can't give favoritism to one religion over another, and it can't give favoritism to no religion over religion. Civil government being ordained of God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. The church should not resort to the civil power to carry on its work. I'm amazed at the number of Baptists who were upset with me when we came out against the state of Florida wanting to teach the Bible in high school. We and the atheists were the only ones who came out against it. Well, you know, when it comes to the atheists, as my East Texas grandmother used to say, even a broken clock's right twice a day. Now, you don't want the government teaching religion. And, and, and my evangelical friends who criticized me soon found that out because the court said, well, you can teach the Bible, which you can't just, you can't use the Bible as a textbook. That'd be favoring the Bible. So they're going to have people for the American way and the Florida State University Religion Department giving excerpts from the Bible with contextual commentary to high school students. How do you like that? That's the blind leading the blind leading the blind. That's exactly what happens when you let the government sponsor religion. They foul it up every time. The gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its ends. The state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal. Now, here's where, here's where you get to the nub of things. We also have, in the Baptist Faith and Message, an article on the Christian and the social order. And I must say to you, Dr. Kelly, that the entire three years that I was here on this campus, not one single professor ever drew my attention to Article 15, the Christian and the social order. They spent a lot of time talking about a free church and a free state. 
But they didn't spend any time talking about the Christian and the social order. I'm sure it's different now. Praise God. Here's what it says. All Christians are under obligation to seek to make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human society. In the Spirit of Christ, Christians, now we changed this for the better. In 1963, we didn't have racism in here. We do now. Should oppose racism, every form of greed, selfishness, and vice, and all forms of sexual immorality, including adultery, homosexuality, and pornography. We should seek, we should work to provide for the orphan, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception to natural death. Now, what does that mean? It means that we have a goal, we have an obligation to seek to bring society as a whole under the sway of the principles of the gospel, the, the moral truths of the gospel. Where do we get that from? We get it from Matthew chapter 5. Verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is a sense forth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are commanded by our Savior, Jesus Christ, to go out into a dark and degenerate world and to be a preservative, a disinfectant, a purifying agent, and to penetrate the darkness with the light of the gospel. Salt is a preservative. Salt stops a dead thing from becoming a rotting thing. I travel all over the place. Weird hours. I was in the air 100, 100 days last year. My wife said to me the other day, said, Honey, what time are you going to be home? I said, Regular time. She said, What time is that? Midnight? I said, No, regular time for normal people. Well, I carry in my briefcase at all times beef jerky. Now, I do this for two reasons. First, as a native Texan, it is my patriotic duty to eat some form of cow every day. It's an act of filial piety. But secondly, some of the stuff that's available to eat at airports is pretty bad. You get more nutritional value from eating the wrapper rather than what's in it. So I carry with me beef jerky because no matter how long I carry it, it doesn't spoil. Why doesn't it spoil? It's been cured with salt. It's had salt rubbed into it. If I just carried a fillet with me, you know, after five or six hours, it wouldn't smell too good. But that beef jerky can stay in my briefcase for a month. And it's still going to be the same beef jerky. It's, it's a dead thing that the, the rot doesn't set in because it's been cured with salt. But you know, if I had salt in one portion of my briefcase and I had beef in the other portion of my briefcase, briefcase it wouldn't do any good. That, that, that meat would rot. The salt has to come into contact with that which it's going to preserve. And I, part of our job as Christians is to go into a degenerate and decaying society and to be a moral preservative, to stop the decay, to stop the rot. But we can't do that if we have closed meetings of the saints. The salt has got to come into contact with that which it's going to preserve. Salt is also a purifying agent. It will disinfect. But what else does salt do? It burns and it stings and it irritates. If you've ever gotten salt into a paper cut, you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps that's why Jesus said, just before he commanded us to be salt and light, he said, Blessed are you 
when men shall revile you and men shall persecute you and men shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake, for so persecuted they me before you. And then Jesus said, You are to be the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Back when I was a sunbeam, and I know that strange credulity, but I was once a sunbeam. Back before they had mission friends. One of the songs I learned was, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Jesus is saying we can't hide the light of the gospel behind the closed doors of a church or our home. We're to go out into the society and let our light so shine before men that they will see the good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. They got to be, we got to be close enough to the world that they can see the light and feel the heat. Now the problem is, the Bible tells us that men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. You go shining light into dark places, and they're going to start taking pot shots at your headlights. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, and men shall persecute you, and men shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake, for so persecuted they me before you. We are to go out into the society and seek to retard evil and its impact by being a preservative, a moral disinfectant. We ought to be people in whose presence it is easier to do and say and think the right thing and in whose presence it is more difficult to do and say and think the wrong thing. We are to be difference makers. Being salt means we seek to stop the killing of unborn babies. A baby, an unborn baby is being killed every 20 seconds. Three babies a minute. 180 babies an hour, 4,000 babies a day, every day for the last 31 years. And God had a plan, God had a purpose for every one of those lives. The Bible is very clear about this. Life begins at conception, Psalm 51. The Bible is very clear. God knitted me and embroidered me together in my mother's womb. All of my parts were written in his book before any of them came to be. Psalm 139, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And while you were in your mother's womb, I sanctified you and made you a prophet to the nation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. That's a literal picture that Paul paints under the power of the Holy Spirit of a, of a pathway of footprints out into the future. And it's a different pathway that's been preordained for every person to come to know Jesus as Savior and then to discover who they are and why God created them and what God's plan and purpose is for their life. The most dangerous place that an American has been the last 31 years is in his or her mother's womb between conception and birth. Because we've killed one-third of all the babies conceived in America for the last 31 years. Have we aborted the next Billy Graham? He could be 31 if his mother aborted him in 1973. Have we aborted the next Abe Lincoln? He could be 30 and already out of law school if his mother aborted him in 1974. Have we aborted... The next Martin Luther King, Jr., he could be out of seminary if his mother aborted him in 1976 or 75. Have we aborted in the womb the, the young woman that God was knitting and embroidering together to come forth and find the cure for cancer? She could be already out of medical school and embarked on her research if her mother aborted her in 1976. There's a one in three chance that's precisely what we've done because we have killed one out of every three babies conceived. Because at least one parent considered that baby to be too embarrassing, too expensive, too ill, or merely too inconvenient. God help us. It's our responsibility to 
put a stop to it. It's our responsibility to insist that our elected leaders and the judges they nominate and confirm put a stop to the wholesale slaughter of the innocent. God is never going to bless America as long as we allow this holocaust of the unborn to continue. That's being salt. Being light is saying God never created the nobody. Everybody is a someone to God. And God has a special plan and purpose for every human life. And we ought to welcome and affirm every human life. It doesn't matter whether it fits our definition of normal, whether it fits our definition of healthy. At the beginning of life, at the end of life, and everywhere in between, every life is sacred to God and ought to be sacred to us. That's being light. And every human being is a human being for whom Jesus Christ died. God died for homosexuals. He loathes and detests homosexual behavior. He loves and wants to redeem homosexuals. God hates and detests rapists. But God loves and wants to redeem rapists. He hates rape, but He loves rapists. He hates murder, but He loves murderers. And so should we. Being salt is stopping the subterranean electronic river of spiritual and emotional toxic waste called internet pornography. We have an obligation and a responsibility to protect our children from it. And when the Supreme Court, 6-3, to three, strikes down a law regulating Internet pornography passed by overwhelming majorities of Democrats and Republicans in both houses of Congress and signed into law first by President Clinton and now by President Bush, it's time for us to overhaul the judiciary. We've reached the place where judges are now saying that an adult's supposed right to see anything they want to see on the Internet trumps society's obligation to protect children from being exposed to that emotional and spiritual toxic waste, and that is absolute nonsense, it's dangerous nonsense, and it's up to us to insist that it change. Pornography is, I believe, the weapon that is being most used by the devil at this moment in time to destroy America. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Being salt is putting a stop to pornography. Being light is telling the truth about God's gift of gender and why it is He created us male and female and why He gave us the gift of sexuality. It's not enough to be against pornography. We've got to be for biblical sexuality. God is not against sex. God invented sex. If you think God's against sex, get a good modern translation of the Song of Solomon and read it. The one book that will never be the winter Bible study book in your lifetime or mine. Hebrews 13 says the marriage bed is undefiled and honorable in all. It's not enough for us to be against the pagan, satanic counterfeit of sexuality that is pornography. We must teach our children and our young people and our adults about the gift of gender and why it is that God created us male and female and why He uses the marriage relationship to describe His relationship with Israel in the Old Testament and the church's relationship with Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and why it is holy matrimony. Sex isn't dirty. Sex is holy within the confines that God has given it. That's being salt, and that's being light. And we have an obligation to go forth if we truly love our neighbors and seek to bring the salt of the gospel and the light of the gospel into public policy and into society, understanding that one of the devil's greatest lies is you can't legislate morality. John F. Kennedy once said, the greatest enemy of the truth is often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. And it is a persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic myth to say you can't legislate morality. We do it all the time. Laws against murder. Laws against theft, 
laws against rape, laws against racism, are the legislation of morality. And when we pass laws making murder, theft, rape, and racism illegal, we are not so much trying to impose our morality on murderers and thieves and rapists and racists as much as we are trying to keep them from imposing their immorality on their victims. And it is always a fatal imposition. Uh, when it's abortion, it's a fatal imposition. You see, murder, rape, theft, racism are not between consenting adults in private. Somebody's doing something to somebody else against their will. And we have a right to say that nobody in the society has an absolute right of life and death over another human being. A mother does not have the right to kill her unborn baby. The society has an obligation to protect the unborn baby because when a woman has an abortion, she's imposing her immorality on her unborn baby and it's always a fatal imposition because the baby dies. It's a great lie to say that you can't, can't, just can't legislate morality. We do it. We should do it. We must do it. Romans 13 says that God ordained the civil magistrate to punish those who do evil and to reward those who do that which is right. If you take away from government the ability to define some form of good and evil and to punish evil and to reward good, you have taken away from society, the, from government, the one reason that God gave us government in the first place. We have an obligation. We have a responsibility to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, to go forth into society and to make a difference, to preserve against decay, to be a moral disinfectant, and to penetrate the darkness with the light of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is our duty. It is our obligation. It is our responsibility, particularly in a country where we have government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Ultimately, we are responsible for our government. Now, I know that there are those among you who are premillennialists. And, they, and you say, well, Dr. Land, it's just not worth it. Things are going to get worse and worse until the Lord comes. Well, I'm a pre-tribulation premillennialist. And there's nothing in my Bible that says there can't be another great awakening. There can't be another reformation before the Lord comes. There have been Christians that have been expecting the second return of the Lord to happen any day for 2,000 years. They thought Mussolini was the Antichrist. They thought Hitler was the Antichrist. There are some who even thought Reagan was the Antichrist. You know, these nutballs who say, well, there are six letters in his first name, and there are six letters in his second name, and there are six letters in his third name, and Ronald Wilson Reagan, six, six, six. Well, there they go again, being crazy. That's just nuts. The second greatest lie of the devil is to say that there are two Gospels, a social Gospel and a spiritual Gospel. There's only one Gospel. And it's the Gospel with a capital G. Being salt and light means that we go forth into the world and we preach the Gospel. We share the Gospel, the life-changing Gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's a denial of the Incarnation for us to go forward and preach the Gospel and ignore the fact that people are hungry and naked and thirsty. We are to go forth and to seek, to feed the hungry and tell them about the bread of life. To give drink to the thirsty and to tell them about the river of living water that they may never thirst again. To go and preach the gospel to the homeless and tell them as well to try to Tell them that in our Father's house are many mansions while we seek to help their housing situation. We're to do both. It's not either or. It's both and. A whole gospel for whole people. And we must always remember that the salt of the law can change attitudes. It can change actions. It's only the light of the gospel that can change attitudes. 
The salt of the law can change behaviors. It's only the light of the gospel that can change beliefs. The salt of the law can change habits. It's only the light of the gospel that can change hearts. And it is our mandate from our Savior to seek in His name to do both. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Would you stand for a closing prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, what mighty shoulders we stand upon today. Had it not been for the intense political activity of Baptist and governmental processes, there might very well have been no religious liberty in the founding of our country. Thank you for those men who cared so passionately about bringing the gospel to the lost and winning them to Christ and building up disciples, but who also felt like they needed to have that right in the marketplace to bring those ideas and preach at any time, anywhere, any place. Father, may we stand in their footsteps. May we fight the battles that must be fought this day so that there will be freedom of worship. There will be freedom to proclaim the truths of your word that we will ever be able to call the truth what it is, that we can stand against the evil and wickedness of this world and stand upon the principles of righteousness. In the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Yeah, I saw George, your CC.